Hi, and welcome back to the European VC, your podcast for insights into the European VC industry. If you love our show, do drop us a review, share it with your friends, and join our Slack community at theeuropeanvc.com forward slash community. And don't forget, if you are about to raise a fund or an international round, do let us know and we'll be happy to introduce you to relevant investors. Today, we're happy to welcome you to Will, managing partner and co-founder of Cocoon Capital, a Singapore-based venture capital firm focusing on early stage enterprise tech companies across Southeast Asia, specifically focused on B2B enterprise and deep tech. The fund prefers to act as lead investor and normally takes a board seat. Will has also invested in over 35 companies since 2004, after co-founding Zoomit.com, which was sold to Yahoo in 2004 through Kelku.com in one of Europe's largest internet transactions till date. Before starting today's episode, we'd like to introduce you to Four Degrees. Four Degrees is the VC Relationship Intelligence CRM that helps you source and close deals in less time. Built by VCs who recognize the power of relationship networks, Four Degrees will transform your network into a living, breathing engine of opportunity by automating the deal-making process. To learn more about how Four Degrees can help you leverage your firm's relationships to move deals forward faster, visit fourdegrees.ai forward slash EUVC. Before we get on with the episode, we want to direct your attention to our upcoming fireside on raising VC funds in certain times. Just hit up our LinkedIn page and register for the LinkedIn Live on June the 7th, 3 p.m. Central European time. Bill, welcome to the show and thank you for finding the time to talk to us here at the European VC. Hey, thanks for having me on. So you are a different beast than what we usually talk to because all the time we talk to European venture managers and everything about the European venture ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But today it's going to be a bit different because we're going to look beyond and it's super exciting for us to better understand the rest of the world just for a couple of times. Do let us know what are your perspectives on the markets that are both globally, but especially, of course, in Southeast Asia where you're most active. Well, you know, I went out here to Southeast Asia in 2003, started investing in 2004. You know, my view, I mean, my career kind of started in Silicon Valley in the late 90s. That's how old I am. Just before the boom stopped kind of and the big bust came in 2000. What I did was I went back to Europe and I saw kind of a tech or online scene that was a little bit behind the US. So, you know, in many ways, I did the same thing when I went out here, right? When I went east, I came to a part of the world that in terms of online adoption and digitization and all of this was perhaps 10 years behind Europe when I came here in 2004. So what excited me and what still excites me is this enormous opportunity. You know, in Southeast Asia, we have 700 million people very soon to to hit that target. Every single day, 100,000 people come online that never ever were connected to the internet before. And that's hard to imagine for us coming from Europe and you guys from the Nordics even where, you know, 90 9% of people are connected to the internet. So that's super exciting. Another aspect is that a lot of the global brain power and the global programming power actually, you know, resides in Southeast Asia and Asia. So also there's a cost advantage to running companies out here, but we can talk more about that later. So all in all, I'm I'm super excited being a European VC in Southeast Asia. I'd love to just double down on the contrasting part that you did. So yes, you saw the U.S., being Mm -hmm. ahead of Europe, and then you were in Europe, and you saw Europe being ahead of Southeast Asia, then you moved to Southeast Asia and helped build up the ecosystem there, and of course also reap the benefits of that. But I'm curious to hear, where do you see Southeast Asia today in comparison to Europe from a venture market perspective? So I think what happened in tech in the last 10 years basically made the other regions of the world catch up much faster. If you look at how fast Europe caught up to the US, for example because the cost of developing tech has come down so significantly. So you have big companies like, you know, Rocket Internet, for example, you can say a lot of things about them. What they did was basically the same thing. They, they saw this can be scalable to bring out models that have worked in Europe and bring it into Southeast Asia and just boost it up. Where it's going from here, I mean, it's just catching up much faster. And I think that in a few years time, you will have some kind of digital equality around the world and 
you will basically see tech spread across the world. For example, GDP or economic power, because tech is so important. It goes through all industries. It's part of everything you do. It's part of all kinds of businesses. That gap is still being closed in Southeast Asia. What was exciting in Southeast Asia is that, first of all, you have the emergence of the middle class and people coming online in the 700 million people region about to become the fourth biggest economy in the world, basically, by, I think, 2030. At the same time, you have a lot of good engineers. And in our portfolio in Cocoon Capital, we see that you know almost half of the companies we are funding actually have a global market. They are actually selling to the entire world. It's just they're based out here where, yes, you know, the amount of AI engineers or sometimes some certain skills that are more developed in the West perhaps is lacking someone here. But the cost base is so much lower, right? It's so much cheaper. And we have the same smart people out here in most of the areas because a lot of people go to Southeast Asia to study, to start businesses, for example. A lot of what we are doing is that we are kind of making sure that the funding opportunity is just as good out here as it would be in, you know, the UK or Stockholm or Silicon Valley, basically unleashing, you know, the entrepreneurs that are out here. So I'm super optimistic. I mean, we can talk about valuations also later. That's an interesting aspect of this too. Yeah, of course, of course. I'm curious just to uh, double click on Southeast Asia because for me, Southeast Asia is a bit I imagine that you're a bit <laughs> in the middle of China and India, and that is two very big players and two markets that are really racing. The horses are out and they're running really sure. quickly. Where does Southeast Asia fit on that scale and how is the collaboration across, if you look at the whole region? So Southeast Asia has kind of been the ugly child, I guess, in, in that setup. <laughs> I imagine. <laughs> we have been, uh, yeah, no, it's a beautiful child. It's been left a bit in the shadow, right, of India and China. Obviously, if you look at U.S. venture capital, a lot of U.S. venture capital went into India and China in in early 2000s and started accelerating from then on. And obviously, both these countries have developed in, in very different ways, I would say, right? And India is definitely an amazing growth engine. China is, you know, a little bit of a separate beast, right, because they are very insulated. But we do see a lot of M&A activity and a lot of interest from Chinese companies wanting to come in. And they are not so keen on buying necessarily Indian companies. They're more keen on buying Southeast Asian companies. First of all, I think culturally it's closer to China. Also the growth rate, I think, of the economy in Southeast Asia is actually more similar to what China is used to. And they just feel kind of more comfortable going in here. That being said, of course, Southeast Asia is a collection of ASEAN, is a collection of 10 countries. They obviously have huge cultural differences. I mean, I would say even more than in Europe, yeah. it is possible, yeah. um, <laughs> language-wise and so on. So Southeast Asia is by far not even close to the integration level we've seen in Europe or even, I would say, Latin America. So that's obviously a challenge. What specific opportunities would you point to in the market? As I mentioned earlier, there are two main kinds of opportunities. It's the regional growth of the economies and solving typical inefficiencies. It's cocoon Capital, we are a B2B fund. I think that's important to say. We are not going after those sexy B2C companies, e-commerce or social media companies. We are not going after ride-hailing giants like Grab or the market where you depend on massive consumer marketing. We are going after the boring companies, so to speak, the B2B companies that you can... Yeah. The good thing with the B2B companies and what I'm excited about here is that you can bring them on to take a pretty good market dominance with limited capital if you solve the problem really well. So I'm excited about the global part of the business where we solve B2B problems globally, but from a lower cost base and with good access to people. I'm also excited about solving inefficiencies in huge markets with sometimes huge transactions where you can unleash a lot of value by cutting out middlemen or intransparent processes, intransparent markets, markets where people have been very comfortably collecting rent without actually adding much value. So we see that across e-commerce, for example, where you go in and basically connect the end buyer, the businesses with the manufacturers or main distributors. We have a company in Vietnam, for example, which has grown from almost selling nothing to being the dominating online platform for pharmaceuticals in Vietnam, grew tremendously during COVID. At some point last year was the only place pharmacies could actually buy pharma products because Vietnam had closed all the physical markets, for example. So that's also saving inefficiencies in terms of money, but it's also 
increasing the quality of the products being distributed and increasing safety for consumers, for example, because many countries in Southeast Asia do a lot of dubious sourcing, sometimes cut costs and to manage supplies. And it's hard for even the large pharmacy to know exactly if that Panadol is actually Panadol and not one of the 20 different knockoffs that are made in different forms and sometimes have no effect at all or are basically pills with just sugar and whatever they put in there. So. Is that type of challenge something you see in other industries as an investor in these companies? To what extent do you want to get involved there? Because that also creates some trust issues between, you know, the big corporates and the companies, as you said, can I trust this is Panadol or not? Is this something that is top on your list of concerns? Just expand a bit on it so we understand it. There are so many concerns that I don't really have any top concerns. <laughs> there, there are just so many things that can go wrong. I, 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 this doesn't sound like an LP pitch meeting, right? Uh, <laughs> But I do tell LPs this when they want to put money into our funds. Investing in, I mean, all of the countries in in ASEAN except Singapore are classified as developing economies. And with the developing economies comes a lot of issues around trust and around having proper processes that we take for granted in in other countries. So I think it's an opportunity. I don't think it's any risk at all. I mean, you are thinking about the fact that we might then still supply the wrong goods and then be liable. Is that what you're thinking about? In a biotech, pharma kind of uh, space, it is quite worrying. In, in others, you know, it might not be as relevant. So I wasn't necessarily thinking of that implication. I was more thinking of how you operate in an ecosystem like that. Yeah, I think what is the good thing with, with most of our companies is that they do something better and they do something cheaper. Although we can never guarantee that everything is perfect, I think what is very easy to demonstrate is that when we go in, we, 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 for example, one of our portfolio companies operate the biggest trucking platform Okay. In Myanmar, obviously a very challenging market right now. And what we're doing there is that this company is organizing truck drivers that before would go down to the city center and, and line up at seven in the morning and ask if there was a job for them. Instead, this company gives them an app and a system where they have a regular income, where we have a tie up with the financial institutions to make sure they get their salary or their payment on time. We make sure that they have proper insurance. We make sure that they have their eyes checked regularly. We have inspection of the depth of their, you know, wheel, whatever you call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we make sure that because of them using the app or in other ways are connected electronically, we make sure that they don't drive more than a number of hours per day so that we comply with international standards, for example. So a lot of these things, I mean, it seems a bit boring, but that's what we like. And it unleashes a lot of value, right, to do these things. And back to my point, it always benefits multiple parties. We're not investing in get-rich-quick schemes that exploit the opportunities. I think we always try to invest in companies that are riding on the current intransparencies, but actually do things better and still in a very profitable way. I'm actually curious because I'm actually unsure to what extent our listeners are aware of the Myanmar situation, for example. It started what, a year and a half ago, two years or so. I think that the coup happened now in, in January 2020. Yeah, exactly. Was it 21? No. I think it was the start of COVID. I believe so as well. <laughs> I believe so. No, but it's not necessarily about the dates, to be honest, yeah. but it's yeah. you know, about a lot of political instability. We personally actually know some remote workers that worked out of Myanmar and they just ran away, to be honest. And I'm curious to hear, you know, with investments in that geography, you know, how did you guys deal with that? Because that is the utmost of instability I can think of. <laughs> well, it's challenging. And I think the team that's there has done very well. Obviously, it's complicated to navigate a situation where you, in many ways, cannot avoid dealing with the government, right? I think what you have to find is to find some middle way to keep operating. You have to also find a way that basically says, overall, this is benefiting the people living there. But you would see other companies like, for example, this Norwegian telecom giant Telenor, who decided instead to pull out of the country. Yeah. They made a choice that they could not operate there without breaching their own rules or getting into trouble. So it's a very complicated situation when things like this happen. So before moving on to the next topic, last time I checked, and it was some time ago, so that if the numbers are outdated, help me out. If I'm not mistaken, Southeast Asia had something uh, around 35 unicorns, 35, 40, something like that. I'd love to have kind of your analysis of the profile of these unicorns, of these big tech successes. You know, you name dropped a second ago, uh, Grab, you know, it's not something that you guys do, but it is, you know, one type of very specific profile of startup. And I'd love to hear your analysis because I don't know the market and I think most of our, our listeners don't know either. There's been a lot of successes coming out of the most populous 
country in Southeast Asia, which is uh, Indonesia, which I believe has around 240 million people. I mean, it's close to the half or 260 million. I should know my facts, right? But uh, it's <laughs> close to half of the market, right, in Southeast Asia. So if you are big in Indonesia or growing fast there, you're kind of, yeah, I can go into some other countries, but, you know, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable in Indonesia. So you have had successes there in travel, in ride-hailing services, and a few other areas. Actually, one of my early investments is actually listing on the New York Stock Exchange in uh, exactly five hours, which is very exciting. <laughs> so I'm going to a big party downtown uh, after this. And that's actually the latest unicorn in Southeast Asia, which is a property search engine called Property Guru. I would say most of the unicorns are connected with consumers. So Southeast Asia has 30 unicorns. Tonight, it's going to be 31, which is very exciting. And that's into the, as I mentioned, the property space, uh, property comparison, uh, property portal. Well, if you look across the 30 unicorns today, they are spread across. So one part is obviously e-commerce. Everything is consumer focused, more or less. You have ride hailing, you have travel, and you have gaming. So one of the biggest successes and the most valuable company is C S E A. Went on Nasdaq, I think, when they IPO'd at the value of one billion. I thought that was pretty insane. <laughs> Obviously, now it's around you know 140, 150 billion. But I think it was actually recently that value came down a bit. I think this valuation I'm looking at now is a little bit outdated. But obviously, it has enormous traction and has has actually also branched into its own e-commerce play. What you see a lot of in Southeast Asia is actually a little bit similar to China. I don't know how much you know about the Chinese ecosystem, but they have had a tendency to create those super apps, right? So you would have in the West, you have WhatsApp, and you, the only thing you can do is basically talk and video and you can text yeah. and WhatsApp. If you have the, the similar WhatsApp in China, WeChat, you can basically do everything and live your entire life within WeChat. And you can work and uh, play and, and uh, you know have a social life there. It's the um, one app to rule them all. <laughs> exactly. And, and you see a number of the bigger unicorns in Southeast Asia have been trying to replicate that. So the biggest ride-hailing company, Grab, has been trying to do the same thing. C, in many ways, have been trying to do the same thing. An important part of what the unicorns out there try to get their hands on is obviously payments, right? And it's not only payments, but it's also financial services. So starting with limited wallets, for example, issuing your own Visa cards, but also probably going into more electronic payments and perhaps at some point crypto. So it's all about capturing this enormous growth in the middle class in Southeast Asia, where people go from living near the poverty line to suddenly starting to spend money. What's interesting in Southeast Asia as a B2C investor, I'm, which I'm not, but what is interesting if you were a B2C investor is that people spend more, a higher percentage of their disposable income on entertainment than in Europe, for example. They spend more time online than people in Europe do today. And that you can, in a way, draw parallels to the Chinese ecosystem where you see right now that more than 10% of retail happens online. That's an enormously high number that came very fast. In Europe, I think we're still slightly less than 10% of retail happening online. China jumped up there very, very fast. And one reason you could think of is that their disposable income grew very fast, but the infrastructure to actually supply the goods people wanted to buy in shops in the second and third tier cities in China wasn't there. You had to go online to find the products you wanted to buy. And that to some extent is the same case in Southeast Asia as well. So I remember going to China for the first time and I remember the feeling of, I I'd almost call it in a sense, hopelessness in that I'm used to having a frame of reference to understand everything around me. It hit me that here in China, I have no idea of anything that's going around me. Uh, mm -hmm. So is that person standing over there, is that person rich? Is, is the person middle class? Is the person looking at me because he's angry or is he just looking at me because I'm a Westerner? Uh, you know, yeah. none of my normal references work there. And I imagine coming to Southeast Asia as a VC is quite a daunting task. So your team, how have you structured it? How many of you are native Southeast Asians? How have you managed to navigate this? Well, we have a team of seven people, out of which four are native Southeast Asians, and three are it's me, Michael Blakey, my co-founder, British, and uh, one Australian associate. So we're definitely diverse, I think. But yeah, it's a good point you're raising. And then if you add on to that the inability to travel over the last two years, right, where we had to do a number of investments with founders we still haven't met. I'm going to Vietnam next week, and I'm actually meeting 
uh, one founder for the first time that I've been working with now for two years. Never met him in real life. So that makes it even harder. And as you correctly point out, I think for Cocoon and, you know, most VCs, I think people are and remain the most important part of a business. And it's really, really important part of our due diligence and decision process when we kind of have crossed the first few hurdles. So liking the business plan and understanding the space and believing in the opportunity, it's, it's down to can these founders execute? And there you see quite a few interesting aspects. And, and the funny thing is, if you go to an emerging market from an area of the world that is more developed in the kind of startup vertical you are starting in, you have a big advantage. And you see a lot of people in Indonesia or people behind a lot of the unicorns that ventured outside their home country, came back and, and brought with them a lot of ideas and because they had seen a more developed part of the world. That's the same I did when I started my business in Europe when I was in my late 20s. And I think that's what you see here as well. So, and I'm going back to your question, the advantage of being what they call a sea turtle, a Southeast Asian, Asian turtle that re returns home to its nest, is that you, you understand perhaps a more developed market in the kind of area you're starting in, but you also understand the local culture, right? So that's the kind of ideal founder profile. And that's why there are VCs that I know about who basically go to US, US universities. They send people out and look at the graduating classes and say, are there any people there from Indonesia who would like to invest in you? <laughs> Pretty extreme. <laughs> well, I think it's the perfect moment in this episode to um, ask you to give us the quick pitch of Cocoon Capital. And I think what's particularly interesting to hear and to then even have a couple of follow-up cues is... Um, on your investment thesis, your investment strategy, and also the origin story, right? What led you to devise it and design it the way it is? Sure. I guess it was, as most things I do, was designed kind of a little bit by accident, but it was also designed with some thinking in, uh, behind it. I co-founded Cocoon with Michael Blakey. I came out to Singapore in 2004. I had kids. I kind of stopped working full-time and I became an angel investor. I did around two deals a year. It was a very reasonable workload, uh, I would say, back in those days. Uh, <laughs> I did pretty okay, uh, mysteriously. And obviously, I did all the mistakes you can do as an entrepreneur turned investor. I was probably a pretty bad investor in the first four or five years. Hopefully, turned a bit better now. But what I did have when I met Michael in 2014, 2015, was that I had been investing for 10 years, right, into startups. And very few people had that 10-year experience of working with startups. I also had been investing with my own money, which I think, I mean, some VCs might disagree with that, but I think it gives you a, a really strong way of looking at opportunities because, you know, you're not really representing other people's money. And if something goes wrong, you take the entire loss yourself. So, so you, you tend to be even more involved. I think being a VC makes you involved in, in any case, but it gives you an even stronger kind of incentive to really be careful about your investments. One thing of course, by doing only two investments per year is that, yes, you are by definition very selective. And then, then I met Michael and I had been trying to find a business partner for probably half a year, a year to kind of start a bigger fund. At, at that time in 2014, Southeast Asia was kind of coming out and starting to be a bit more interesting when it came to digital and tech opportunities. Uh, Singapore saw a lot of funds coming. So we kind of wanted to start something that could kind of gather a bit more capital and instead of having to syndicate every round we did at the seed stage, we could then invest the entire round from the fund. So that was something that Michael also wanted. And he had done the same thing. So he had been investing out in the UK for like 14 years at that time, since 2000, doing also two, three deals a year. So we had kind of very similar experience. Our IRR was not bad. So we basically said, why don't we start a small seed fund? We should probably do seed because, you know, Series A is too much money to advance for us. We, we kind of like to be at the seed stage where things are fussy, unclear, nobody knows what they're doing. They're just getting to understand that. That's where we kind of felt comfortable and that's where we created value. Looking back at our investment record, we had done a lot of B2C. I think in 2014, it became clear that it was quite expensive to launch a new B2C company, even in Southeast Asia. And we said, let's do only B2B. No one else is saying that. Everyone else that started their fund was doing B2C. We looked at the proceeds of investment. I think 90% had gone to B2C companies, 10% to B2B. So, so we basically said, let's do that. And off we went. So... Another thing that we found that both of us have been doing was that we actually had worked quite closely with founders, right? We actually had spent a lot of time coaching, sitting down and doing the hard work, a lot of times, probably too much work 
has probably led me to understand that we shouldn't do too much work. Then we should rather start a new company, right? Instead of being a VC. So, but both of us had at least the kind of ethos to help founders never charge for it. By the way, there are funds that charge to help founders. I think that's absolutely wrong and immoral for multiple reasons. We can talk about that another time. So we found that we actually shared those values. That's the main ethos of Cocoon. Investing in a few companies, no more than six a year, although we end up with doing five. We basically change 2,000 opportunities we see every year down to five real investments. We work with those companies for two years. On day one, we start preparing for the next round. Something we launched in 2020 was something we call the Cocoon Academy. So we often assume that founders know everything or we make assumptions without even thinking about it. And we talk about cash flow and marketing strategy and, and brand strategy. And we find out that some founders know more than us and some founders know very little for a certain kind of topic. So we basically said, why don't we have a small MBA program that we drive ourselves? We have a 16 hour MBA, mini MBA, the Cocoon Academy. We take them through that in 16 weeks. And that's the onboarding process with Cocoon Capital. This is not the right thing for some founders. We warned them beforehand that we're going to push a 16 hour MBA program on them. Some most of them are very happy, right? And it's also a great way to get to know them, right? And also find out where they're strong, where they need more support. And it's also a great way to basically, you know, find out what's lacking. So find out what's the management team we need to help them build in the next 24 months to make them ready for Series A. I think there's something around your thesis that I need to ask. Sure. <laughs> we just ran through the 30 unicorns and you very correctly pointed out that they are primarily B2C. And you picked this a sweet spot where there was no one really piling in money. But looking at the exit side, it also would seem from the outside that mm -hmm. the big ones are the B2C companies. So are you happy? <laughs> Not how you're happy about your choice, but explain to us why it makes sense to stay in B2B when the region is so dominant in B2C. I think that's a very sensible question, right? And I, as I pointed out, luckily I, I'm invested in at least one unicorn. <laughs> but mm -hmm. And that's a B2C company. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hope it stays a unicorn. But you're right. I think it's something to do with timing. I think it's something to do with where we are in 2022. I, I think you're going to see uh, quite a few B2B unicorns in the next five to seven years. I think most likely have a, a reasonable stake in, in a few of them. I think we are looking there at, I mentioned e-commerce. We have fintech, for example, things like, you know, computer or cybersecurity, some of them local, some of them original, some of them global. But uh, yeah, the B2C train has kind of, I think, left the station in a way. And I agree as, as a business angel, I, I missed quite a few of them. Then I would like to point out that, you know, being a venture capital fund, your primary reason to exist is that you want to give, first of all, you want to invest in, in cool founders and help them get financed, but you also want your LPs to get a reasonable IRR on the investment. Yes, there are 30 unicorns, but that's still quite few unicorn companies in a region with 700 million people. If you want to build great IRR for your LPs, what is better? Always try to go after unicorns and have a quite low hit rate or build a lot of companies that reach $100, $150 million in value. And then you have to look at, at what stage in the company do you come in, right? If you come in at the seed stage, the failure rate at the seed stage is extremely high. I mean, statistically speaking, nobody should invest at the seed stage. You know, even you as business angels have a negative return on their investment as a kind of asset class, investment class. I think our strategy was basically trying to do the same thing we've done before, right? Trying to prevent companies from failing. And we found that to be a much better strategy to get a great IRR than trying to go after unicorns. It's very interesting. And that's also, I guess, shown in the number of investments that you do every year. Because if you just try and hit the ones that will skyrocket by themselves, then you want to hit try and hit as many as possible. Yeah. Whereas if you actually need to make sure they survive and help them grow, then you want to be a lot more concentrated. Very true. To have a model where you give deep and comprehensive coaching and offer a lot of resources to founders, as you're saying, yeah, you cannot go into that high game. So you have other companies that are very successful doing a different play than we do. I mean, when I, sometimes I meet 500 startups on stage and I say, I'm from five startups. That's how we are different. I like that. <laughs> That's funny. I think this is the perfect segue into another topic that we wanted to dive, which is the Southeast Asian opportunity for LPs. 
adventure. And without asking you to disclose too much, I think what would be interesting is understanding the LPs of Cocoon, where are they coming from in terms of geographies? Mm. And how do you make it clear in your conversations with them and when you're pitching uh, the fund to them? This is a clear opportunity that, and how do you get them excited to be part of that opportunity, actually? The general answer to that is that it's not necessarily easy. I think it's an interesting situation. It comes down to the fund size, in a way. Because if we are to only invest in five companies a year, our fund size cannot be too big. The more sophisticated LPs that have a clear strategy and have a lot of time to analyze markets, they tend to be larger LPs, larger family offices and endowment funds and pension funds. And they cannot easily invest a stake into our company without owning too much of it. If you go to the people that can invest, a lot of them find Southeast Asia to be still extremely risky. Uh, they don't know enough about it. We have people from all the regions of the world. It's mostly dominated by smaller family offices and high net worth individuals. We do have a pension fund. We do have a larger family office, but those are far between in a way. So this is definitely something that people see as much more risky than investing into a venture fund in Europe. Another thing that works against us is that if you go into, you know, typical databases for LP performance, a lot of the funds have not even had their full cycle yet, right? Because it's such a new ecosystem. So you need to have quite a bit of risk appetite and you have to have a pretty good understanding of the opportunity and you also have to develop trust. So we do see that the LPs that do put in larger checks with us, that those are people we have talked to for quite, quite some years and then spent quite some time with. But on the other hand, we have LPs that are extremely interested in the space. We have LPs that sometimes join the board, so selected you know, portfolio companies that come in and join us in future rounds, push themselves in, are super happy with the returns, and will make a lot of money on this because they will make tremendous returns. Because, of course, the advantage of being an LP in a high-risk fund like us is that you know some of the companies are doing extremely high multiples. If you look at the company I'm celebrating tonight, I mean, if you look at the valuation today and, and the valuation where I invested, we're talking about 1,000x. <laughs> the only other time I had 1,000x was when I sold my own company to Yahoo in 2004. Because you go in at the seed stage, and if you follow those companies as an LP in a very active fashion and then selectively try to go in and do future rounds, you can make an extremely high profit. The thing that we didn't talk about, which we usually try to explain to LPs, is that because... Southeast Asia so far has been somewhat of a not good looking child. It's a big discount on the valuations in Southeast Asia. It's, it's somewhat unfair to entrepreneurs. You see it at the seed stage. You see it uh, somewhat at the Series A stage, where a similar company, just by changing its address to Silicon Valley or downtown London, right, would probably command three times higher value. But it's excellent for LPs because obviously, as soon as you reach Series B and Series C, you see a lot of international investors coming in and bidding for those rounds. And you see that valuations and metrics all start to match up with the global way of valuing companies. And is that flipping part a substantial part of your strategy in the sense you said earlier that from day one, you start working towards the next round? Well, we never and flip. We never flip. No. Okay. And flip. why not? First of all, Series A, as I said, is also partly undervalued. And the companies that open up for flipping opportunities are the companies we don't want to flip. Yeah, of course. Yeah. The companies we can flip are the companies we can flip and we want to flip. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not very interesting. I'm curious just to uh, ask one question before we go to the quick fire, which is your LP makeup. You said that they need to be willing to take the risk and, and so on. They also need to probably understand the Southeast Asian opportunity better than most. Is there an, typically a pre-existing affinity for Asia, Southeast Asia? amongst them or that is not a criteria that you're looking for when you're targeting LP? Not always, no. Sometimes and, and sometimes they're also based in Asia, which makes it much easier. Of course, we have a number of investors from Singapore, for example, where we are based. Yeah, no, that's a mix. It's not a clear view. I, I think we meet a lot of LPs that are curious and are very open to global opportunities. I mean, one of our biggest LPs also invest in Africa, for example, which I know nothing about. But he's happily going there and, and meeting, meeting startups. Uh, you know, I, I think it's more adventurous LPs for sure. But the funny thing is that it makes a lot of financial sense, right? And of course, if you are managing a portfolio and you think it's too risky to move 
essential of your funds into one of the fastest growing economic regions of the world, I don't think you're doing a good job. And with that, we move into the quick fire round. The quick fire round is when we ask quick answer questions, ideally 30 to 60 seconds each. Are you ready? Sure. So in venture, what areas excite you the most that other people don't really feel that excited about? And feel free to deep dive into technologies or subsectors or whatever that might be. As I said, I think we like boring business models that will never get on the front page of any newspaper. I think, I think that that's, that's the answer to that. We, we like people that solve a real problem that could be an extremely unknown problem that only people in the industry would know about that companies would be super willing to pay for. So, uh, Will, second question is quick fire round, which is what would be your top tips to emerging fund managers who are actually raising in emerging markets? My top tip would be that it's really hard to find LPs that will jump on that opportunity right away. So my tip would be to start working with LPs early, be ready to visit them multiple times, I think. You have to be even more transparent about how you do things and even more transparent on the companies you want to invest in and be really good at showing traction in similar companies that have exited or gotten traction earlier. You are already having to work quite hard to raise any fund anywhere. But I think when you do it in an emerging market, you have to explain just basically every part of it in a much more comprehensive way to counter that kind of understanding of risk. You also have to be willing to show that you believe in that. One thing we did, for example, was that we are still not taking any salary from the fund. So since we launched Cocoon in 2016, Michael and I haven't taken a single cent of salary from Cocoon Capital. Because we said, look look at us, the only way we're going to make money is on the carry after you get all your money back and then we'll take a small carry from you. I mean, we're not taking a small carry, we're taking a market level carry, but we are not getting rich. It doesn't matter how big the fund is and we are not driven by raising a huge fund next time because we're not getting anything out of it. Actually, the larger fund we raise, the more we have to work, right? So, so we will never go it's and change. Reverse. It's the reverse, right? Because... Yes, we can employ more people, but, but we make nothing. We just have to work even harder and pay even more back to, to the LPs. That's one thing and, and one idea you could do to really show that you really believe in your own story. Third and final question of the quick fire, Will, which is what can we expect in the future from you and from Cooking Capital? Well, I, I think you can expect that you're going to see a lot of interesting developments in our portfolio in the next, I think, 24 months. We see a lot of companies are growing really, really fast. I think you're going to see that we keep investing at the same pace as we have done before. We are not following the trend of raising larger and larger funds because we're not part of that kind of competition. I think we are, in that sense, boring as well. We like boring companies and perhaps we are pretty boring VC fund as well. But our main aim is to deliver a good IRR. And we think we found that sweet spot of speed. We found the sweet spot, I think, in enterprise tech. And we like the seed stage. We might raise more funding to double down in later rounds. I think that's the only change you will see. But that would be within the existing seed portfolio. So, Will, thank you. I hope this wasn't a boring episode with a boring manager <laughs> operating in a boring market. <laughs> but before we let you go, I have to ask a question that I sometimes ask. And that's because all throughout this uh, recording, I've been looking at the Southeast Asian version of the screen behind you. That's right. Yeah, I want to hear a bit about the story there and why you picked that one. <laughs> this is my daughter's painting. It's a combination of this Japanese anime character which I forgot the name of, Edward Monk from Norway. I can find that out later. Yeah, no, that's it's, a, awesome. it's, a very, it's a very famous anime character. It's yeah. called yeah. Spirit something, something, something. <laughs> Spirit <laughs> If your daughter will accept it, we will uh, share a photo of it uh, together. Oh, with please. You. you can also buy the NFT on uh, OpenSea. Ah, of course. I'd rather have the physical one behind you. Okay, I mean, <laughs> that's, uh, that's possible. <laughs> That's a shout out to everyone listening in. We have some pretty wealthy uh, LPs listening. So I'm sure that your daughter will now become richer than you. That's uh, not unlikely. Uh, that's very likely, actually. <laughs> if she's on the uh, <laughs> NFT wave, I'm sure that she will be. I'm pretty sure as well. Thanks a million for joining us. This was awesome, Will. You haven't been boring at all. <laughs> Thank you. 
Four Degrees is the VC Relationship Intelligence CRM that helps you source and close deals in less time. Built by VCs who recognize the power of relationship networks, Four Degrees will transform your network into a living, breathing engine of opportunity by optimizing the deal-making process. To learn more about how Four Degrees can help you leverage your firm's relationships to move deals forward faster, visit fourdegrees.ai forward slash EUVC. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of The European VC, your podcast for insights into the European VC industry. If you love our show, do drop us a review, share it with your friends, and join our Slack community at theeuropeanvc.com forward slash community. And don't forget, if you would like to suggest topics or guests for future episodes, join our community and help make the best pod for everything European VC. And if you are about to raise a fund or an international round, do let us know and we'll be happy to introduce you to relevant investors.